So where is this idea leading us then? Well, what I'm arguing is that where it leads us is to the idea of agents. And so let's introduce the first of several definitions of agents that we're going to use in this book and in this series of videos. And this is the simplest definition. So when we think about an agent, we're thinking about a, a computer system which is acting on our behalf. It's acting to carry out some delegated task on our behalf, and it's doing this in some kind of semi-autonomous, semi-intelligent way. And very often, that agent will have to interact with other agents that are acting on behalf of other people. And when you put those agents together, what you get is a multi-agent system. Okay? And when you put those agents together and they're acting on, each, on, on behalf of other individuals, then the issues that you start to have to worry about are not just issues like deadlock and livelock that have been studied in the distributed or networked systems community. They're issues like, how are we going to build these agents so that they can cooperate and coordinate with one another? What if, in order to achieve my goal, then my piece of software, my agent, needs to negotiate with your agent, where your agent is trying to achieve your goal? So issues like cooperation, coordination, and negotiation have not been studied until relatively recently in computer science. And this is one of the big contributions, in my view, of the multi-agent systems paradigm. So an agent, our first definition of an agent, is just a semi-autonomous piece of software which acts on behalf of its owner or user, that is figuring out how to satisfy its owner's or its user's goals or desires on their behalf. And a multi-agent system is where such agents are just interacting with one another. And the key issue there is that they require the ability to cooperate, coordinate and negotiate with other agents in order to achieve their delegated goals. Let's see a couple of examples of agents uh, uh, being used in practice. So the first one is admittedly a little bit extreme, but it's nevertheless an important one. And this is to do with, um, uh, this is to do with space probes. Okay, so when NASA or similar organizations like the European Space Agency, ESA, when they send out space probes to, let's say, the outer planets, the way that things work is these space probes don't do any thinking for themselves. That is, everything they do is planned in meticulous detail by a ground crew, a large ground crew of highly paid engineers, uh, who, who in, in essence produce a program of instructions which is transmitted to the space probe and blindly executed. And these instructions will be along the lines of open this valve for this many seconds, then close it, then open this valve for this many seconds, then see if you can, uh, uh, then see if you can, you can track some particular signal, those sort of things. Very low level, blindly executed list of instructions. Well, for all sorts of reasons, this is not a terribly desirable state of affairs. The most obvious reason is that if things go wrong and your probe is in the outer planets, your ability to handle things going well, going wrong, is extremely limited. Okay? The probe's not thinking for itself, and it encounters a situation that the ground crew didn't anticipate, then uh, game over. Okay, so that's one reason why it's not desirable. Another reason why it's not desirable, frankly, is that this is incredibly labor-intensive. It's extremely expensive to have highly paid NASA engineers or ESA engineers producing these very low-level lists of instructions which are sent up to a space probe and blindly executed. So for these reasons, uh, it seems desirable to give space probes and similar higher degrees of autonomy, that is to offload some of the decision making to the space probe itself. So that, for example, it can deal with some unforeseen situations. Now again, we need to, we need to wrap this in some caution marks. We're not thinking about space probes that want to decide to change their mind about where they're going to go. You know, I'm going to go to Uranus instead of Venus. That's not the point. But just to have greater decision-making capability on board these space probes so that when things go wrong, they're better able to handle it. Okay? And the overall system is more robust. Okay, so uh, to test out these ideas, NASA deployed a space probe in, I believe, 1998. The space probe was called DS-1, where they used a software architecture for decision-making, uh, which is very closely related to some of those that we're going to study in these films and in the textbook. Okay, well, most of us 
uh, don't write software for NASA, so that's perhaps a little bit of an extreme example. So let's have a look at a slightly more everyday example. And this is one that got a lot of people excited when the internet emerged in the 1980s. So the idea is having agents that operate for us on the internet. So every day, millions of people use the internet for routine but rather tedious tasks. So for example, I've got to book some uh, business travel, and which involves booking a taxi, well, it involves finding out about appropriate flights first to a particular destination, let's say Frankfurt, then once I found the different flights, comparing the details of those flights, do they fit with my required timings, are the costs okay, are these airlines happy, the ones that I'm happy to fly with, and so on. Okay, so once I've identified the flight, then I need to start booking things like hotels uh, in Frankfurt, I need to book a taxi or however it is that I'm going to get to the airport and make more detailed arrangements. And all of this is in some sense routine, the information is all there on the internet, but assembling it, putting it together in the right way, given my preferences, it, at the moment requires people to do, to do, to do this. So why not have a computer program that could do this kind of thing for us, that could assemble a package of, let's say, uh, a flight, a hotel and so on, on my behalf, given that it knows about my preferences, about which airlines I like to fly with, which airlines I don't like to fly with, the fact that I don't like flying through Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport because they always lose my luggage, and so on, right? to take all these things into account. Uh, and this is the idea of internet agents. And as I say, it's an idea that a lot of people got excited about in the 1990s and for which significant progress has, uh, has been made. So this example here on the slide just explains the idea of a, an agent which is capable of assembling uh, a, a package uh, of information given some requirements that you have, where you go to a number of different websites in order to get partial solutions to a particular problem and is then capable of assembling those partial solutions to make an overall solution. So that's the idea of internet agents. So, in summary then, an agent is a computer program that's capable of taking some delegated task or goal and working semi-autonomously in order to accomplish that task or achieve that goal. A multi-agent system is where a number of such agents meet and interact and the key point is that if their goals are different, and they will be if typically if they're acting on behalf of different owners or different users, then they need the ability to cooperate, coordinate or negotiate with one another in order to operate effectively. And we've seen two examples, the NASA space probe example and the slightly more mundane but nevertheless important internet agents example to illustrate this idea. So what is this course about? Right? I've painted you a vision of what I think agents are and why I think agents are important. What is this course about? Well, it's about two key problems. These two key problems are, firstly, if we want to build one of these agents, how do we do it? How do we put a single agent together? And the key issue there is the decision making. Going from a delegated goal, a goal or a task which a user or owner gives to a computer program and figuring out for itself how to accomplish that task. Deciding what to do. Something that can decide what to do essentially is an agent. And that's the agent design problem. And the society design problem is what happens when you put a bunch of these agents uh, together with one another. How can we design computer programs that can cooperate, coordinate, or negotiate with one another in order to accomplish these goals. And we sometimes talk about these two different perspectives on the multi-agent systems paradigm as being the micro and macro perspectives. 